So for this, I'm going to offer you Janssen's four room model. It's another change management model, but this one actually talks about how people often feel going through the change. And I'm actually going to overlap a few models in here. So this is where I tell you to kind of buckle up <laughs> because this is going to give you a lot, a lot of data. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pull you in. We're going to imagine that a change that we're going through is a house. Now, this change could be a big change. It could be a little change. But typically, um, you know, before there is any kind of change, many people experience contentment where everything is normal. Um, there in this contentment room of the house, there are soft lights and, and nice music and easy chairs. And this is where. Um, we've already we, we've we've overcome the past and now we've we've implemented things so we're getting used to a sense of normalcy here, but then something happens so there's a little bomb goes off boom something happens and we need to seek refuge the organization or something is changing, and then what happens is we go we go into potentially the safest room which is denial, and so in denial we still want everything to be fine but it's not there's more happening this is where the air is a little thicker there's no windows in this room maybe we're sitting on our feelings this is a room we pass through but we don't live in it and if you confront someone who's in denial they will deny it and people don't stay here eventually they realized something is really going on and they pass through to a door and enter the room of confusion. Now, this is where anxiety tends to be the core decor. Uh, there's loud music. There are many doors to choose from, and we don't really even know where to start. And as we live in this space of a confusion, we start to notice patterns. We start to connect the dots. This might also be thought of as the grown zone because there's a lot of information in this area that we need to make sense out of. This is a seedbed for creativity and is a necessary and critical step to go through in order to create the learning that happens in renewal. And so passing through, once we choose a path and we get through the confusion, we plant seeds for the new normal in renewal. So there's a person planting seeds. This is where we can appreciate where we've been and we can step back and we can say, oh, that's what it was for. That's the big picture. We learned a lot through that change. So now you have a sense of what the four stages that many people go through, contentment, denial, confusion, renewal, um, and you might have team members that are in very different parts of this model, okay? So what's in, how, how to use this? So the first way to use this is you can, you can actually align this to the Tuckman model, the form, storm, norm, perform. When we transition from contentment to a change, there's forming that needs to happen. When we transition from denial or, or from this forming um, and move through denial into confusion, that's where the storming may happen. It's in the transition from uh, confusion to renewal that we can experience some norming where we can see what works, what doesn't work, let's put it into practice. And, and it's in the renewal to contentment space that we experience performance. So then you, so you can really see how this model and the Tuckman model align, which then brings me to Blanchard. So what the only thing that's the most important way for you to use this model is to think, where do you show up as a leader managing teams who are in this house? And so on the outside of this model, you can see the alignment of situational leadership. When we're in a space of contentment, everything is normal, and then all of a sudden there's a change, that's when directing or situational leadership level one may be the best response. This is where you're going to express the urgency, the why. You may be forming the coalition or talking to key stakeholders, getting a sense of who is impacted, creating the vision and communicating that out. This all happens in the form stage, in this stage when something has happened and we're moving into this next room. 
when people are maybe in denial, this is a time for coaching or situational leadership level two. This is where approaching with curiosity and asking open-ended questions helps. When we can help people um, process the change, that will get them from a space of denial into a space of confusion, but where they need to be in order to see possibility. Some coaching questions you could use, what's coming up for you, what do you need right now? What is most important to you? It's getting to know people in their current state, not trying to prove to them anything, but really coaching them through and asking, what do you need right now? Then once we are able to get into a space of confusion, this is where, you know, and there could be some coaching here too, maybe even some directing, um, but where you could lean into your supportive role here the, in, this, in this norming phase, move into a supportive role. And perhaps the, um, the, the Cotter model where it talks about empowering action, just to go back, we're over here now, empowering action, creating quick wins, that that can happen in this space. Because knowing where we're winning will help us know which door we want to work through. Empowering action may mean doing some additional coaching, maybe asking people what information do they need? What feedback do you have? What would gain your buy-in? How would you like to be more involved in what resources are needed? How would you like to be more involved? How would What would gain your buy-in? Those are questions that you can ask where people will tell you exactly what they need and it may be something you missed. So asking those questions from a supportive lens, from an inquiry space, will help people get on board, but then it'll also help you to choose the right door. Looking for short-term wins could also mean asking where, it, where are things working well and how might we scale that? Um, so, uh, and, then, and then asking, most importantly, how do we let people know? So is who's doing the communication? Again, going back to that very, very important comms piece throughout this process, your comms plan is going to have, um, it, it may have a, a weekly layout of what messages need to go out who, to whom and through what channel. So beginning to think about strategic communications as a, as a big part of this. And lastly, the, um, the renewal room. And so this is where we're consolidating our gains, we're anchoring our new approaches and, um, and really coming to the end of the Cotter model. So this is where delegating as a leadership tool may be the, the best choice consolidating gains and producing more change. Again, that's where we talked about a retrospective where you ask questions such as what's working, what's not working, what have we learned, what will we do differently? Those are great questions for this space. It's a learning space. And then anchoring new approaches, checking in with employees, removing obstacles. We are, we are trying to make sure that whatever the change is, we're making sure it's sustainable um, so that we can get to a space again of contentment where we are, have now harvested and are happy with the seeds that we have planted. So this, um, the way to use this again is not to say that if your change doesn't happen in this order that it's not working correctly. Use this as a way to say, so-and-so on my team seems to be in denial. Maybe I'll try some coaching with that person. Or I have a big change that needs to come out, come out, and I think it's going to be a very confusing time. I'm going to meet with my team and ask them some questions about what kinds of resources that they need so I can support them. So that, that would be how to use this model as a thought tool, not a it must go in this order.